The Book of Enoch, found within the Dead Sea Scrolls, quoted by Jude, taught from by Peter and our Messiah, this great text was preserved for the end times generation, a guidebook for those coming out of Mystery Babylon, coming out of Egypt and her ways into the true service of our Elohim. Join us as we read through and study this amazing gift line by line. Shabbat Shalom and welcome back brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard YouTube live stream of our Book of Enoch line by line study. This is part 7 and we're going to be going through chapters 25 through 36. That's right, you heard it. We're going to be going through quite a few chapters tonight. Um, so I hope you're prepared. Uh, we have a lot to cover. Let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, Yahweh Most High, we come before you. Bless you and praise you in your son, Yahushua's name, and thank you for salvation by belief in him, your word, Father. And we thank you for opening our eyes to the wonderful matters, Father, in these last days of your truth. And we just bless you and thank you for all that you do, all the works of your hands, Father. And I pray that eyes and ears would be open through this study and through hearing of your word tonight. And Messiah, Yahushua's name, we do bless and praise you. Amen. Now, a little shofar, and then we'll get started right into it. Okay, so here we are in chapter 24. We're just going to review um, what we read last week. And don't worry, we're not going to retread what we did last week. But um, this week's portion kind of piggybacks the second half of chapter 24. So let's just read that and let's, let's move on. Chapter 24, And from thence I went to another place of the earth, and he showed me a mountain range of fire which burnt day and night. And I went beyond it and saw seven magnificent mountains, all differing each from the other. And the stones thereof were magnificent and beautiful, magnificent as a whole of glorious appearance, and a fair exterior, three towards the east, one founded on the other, and three towards the south, one upon the other, and deep, rough ravines, no one of which joined with any other. And the seventh mountain was in the midst of these, and it excelled in them in height, resembling the seat of a throne, and fragrant trees encircled the throne. And amongst them was such a tree as I had never yet smelt. Neither was any amongst them, nor were others like it. It had a fragrance beyond all fragrance, and its leaves and blooms and wood wither not forever. And its fruit is beautiful, and its fruit resembles the dates of a palm. Then I said, how beautiful is this tree and fragrant and its leaves are fair and its blooms very delightful in appearance then answered michael one of the holy and honored angels who was with me and was their leader so last week we spoke well about an hour and a half about uh the seven mountains and their significance um so if you want to learn more about that Check out last week if you hadn't, uh, which is part six, where we literally just spent uh, uh, an hour and a half talking about uh, these mountains and previous chapters, chapter 18 and uh, chapters in the future, uh, I think in the 50s, uh, all talking about these mountains. But tonight, uh, we're going to be talking about this tree, other trees, and more about just the heavenly kingdom. And I believe what we're going to see here is Enoch is going to get little glimpses of the heavenly kingdom, the heavenly new Jerusalem. And, well, we'll talk about that as we go along. But, uh, of course, this tree here we see here uh, is, of course, talking about the tree of life. And we're going to see a little more of that here in chapter 25, where Enoch asked the question, like, hey, what is this tree? Like, what is this? Right? And so this is Michael. And he said unto me, Enoch, why do you ask me regarding the fragrance of the tree? And why do you wish to learn the truth? Then I answered him, saying, I wish to know about everything. And I don't know about you, but in this age of really information and how the Most High has revealed wisdom in these last days and unsealed books and 
I don't know about you, but that's, I, I'm like, you know, like, hey, I want to know about everything. Like, I want to know. Tell me. Show me. Teach me. I want to know. So he says, I wish to know about everything, but especially about this tree. And he answered, saying, This high mountain which you have seen, whose summit is like the throne of Elohim, is his throne, where the Holy Great One, the Yahuwah of glory, the eternal King, will sit when he shall come down to visit the earth with goodness. And as for this fragrant tree, no mortal is permitted to touch it till the great judgment, when he shall take vengeance on all and bring everything to its consummation forever. It shall then be given to the righteous and holy. Its fruit shall be for food to the elect. It shall be transplanted to the holy place, to the temple of Yahuwah, the eternal king. Then shall they rejoice with joy and be glad. And into the holy place shall they enter. And its fragrance shall be in their bones. And they shall live a long life on earth, such as thy fathers lived. And in their days shall no sorrow or plague or torment or calamity touch them. So it's interesting that when they eat of this uh, um, fruit of the, the, the tree of life, that it, they live a long life. And so what's interesting is, you know, if we look at the ages from Adam all the way down to, well, let's say when we get to David, it likes like David 70 years old, right? Was it 70 or 80 he died? I think it was 70 when he died. Uh, nevertheless, it was somewhere in that range. Uh, but if you back up, like Abraham, was he 175 or 185? Um, and then Noah, like it was at 950 and then of course we get you know go back all the way to adam so they used to live that long life and it's slowly slowly depleted and of course um like some of the you know ages of um the, the generations before abraham like 400 years 300 years 200 years so, and it slowly dwindled down abraham was at 175 or 185 i can't remember um and then jacob was 147 i believe um joseph was 110 um, and so we see it like kind of slowly dwindles down. Of course, now it went back up with Moshe 120, but still uh, less than Abraham, less than, than Jacob. And so I wonder if it says its fragrance shall be in their bones. I wonder if that like, you know, was like in their, let's just call it, I don't know if DNA is the right word, but it was in their, in, in their bodies, right? And slowly over time, it, like it, you know, um, the amount, I guess, you know, dwindled away. Just, just, you know, just thinking, um, you know, the book of two Ezra, it says that as the earth grows on, the stature of men gets less and less as well. Um, also, like we see in the giants, in the, like in the early days of the book of Enoch, they were like super tall, like depending on what translation you read, let's say like 300 feet tall. But then by the time, like David's time, what was Goliath? Like maybe, well, again, depends on the translation, um, 12 feet tall, 16 foot tall, nine foot tall, either way, but you know, the height slowly dwindled down. So, uh, just, just, you know, something I was thinking of, uh, interesting. Uh, but here, I'm sorry, let's just finish this. Then blessed I, the Elohim of glory, the eternal king, who has prepared such things for the righteous and has created them and promised to give them. And so, of course, the tree of life we read here in Revelation 22. We'll read it 1 through 15. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. And we're going to see rivers of water today. And and uh, we and uh, I'm sorry, uh, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of Elohim and of the Lamb. And we just saw the throne here. In the book of Enoch 25 and 24, in the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So the leaves are for the nations and the fruit are for his children. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of Elohim and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall be so, shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. We're going to read that a little bit later tonight, tonight too. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither the light of the sun, for Yahweh Elohim gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And Yahweh Elohim of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keeps the sayings of the prophecies of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. 
Then said he unto me, See that you do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship Elohim. And he said unto me, Seal not these sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Now listen, we want to eat from the tree of life. We want to enter into the garden. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Let no one deceive you, just in case you're new. Let no one deceive you, saying that the commandments have been done away with, the Torah has been done away with. They absolutely have not. These are just doctrines of men, lies of men that have been compiled over the years. All right? And... Um, you know, some would say, hey, well, Messiah said we only have two commandments. We, we, we love God, right? We love Elohim, and we love our neighbor. Well, yeah. How do we do that, right? Is it just like like let's you know, like loving your neighbor? Is it just, you know, waving high and, and saying, hey, how y'all doing? And giving a hug. and Or how do we love our neighbor, right? How do we love God? We just tell him and say, hey, I love you. He'd say, well, show me. How do you do that? Well, his commandments tell us how to do it, especially specifically the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments get expounded, expanded of what that looks like in the Torah. For without, so people that won't get in are with dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loves and makes a lie. So. Let's also take a look at Ezekiel 47, 1 through 12. Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. And we're going to read more about this here in a bit. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward and led me about the way without unto the utter gate by the way that looks eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. And again, he measured a thousand, and he brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the knees. And again, he measured a thousand, and brought me through, and the waters were to the loins. And afterward, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over. For the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. And he said unto me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the, the river. Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very, very many trees on the one side and on the other. Then he said unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country and go down into the desert and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the water shall be healed. And it shall come to pass that everything that lives, which moves, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great, great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither. For they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river comes. And it shall come to pass that the fisher shall stand upon it from Engedi even to Enaglaim, and they shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. But the miry places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt." And by the river upon the brink, the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. So here we have multiple witnesses of this uh, tree, that those who, of course, keep the commandments that they will have the right to it and may enter into the city. So this is probably the most important part of the study. Regardless of anything else we read, this is it. This is the meat right here. We're going to move a little faster than we normally do. We're going to finish up this portion because uh, next week we're going to be getting into the parables. All right, so chapter 26. And I now, so... Remember, so Enoch is being shown 
a vision. He's been sh- he's showing things here. And remember, before we read all this, remember when Moses built was instructed to build the tabernacle in the wilderness. Elohim said that everything he was building was a copy of what was in heaven. So when we think of things kingdom-wise, heavenly kingdom, earthly kingdom, there's patterns on earth as the patterns in heaven. So just keep that in mind. All right, so chapter 26. And I went from thence to the middle of the earth. And there's a couple times in this book I wonder if the earth could be translated to land. I don't know. And I saw a blessed place in which there were trees with branches abiding and blooming of a dismembered tree. Now, there's a lot to actually unpack here, but he went to the middle of the earth. Now, it's interesting, um, you know, even uh, even the writer, you know, annotates it here. This is, he's seeing Jerusalem, right, and the mountains and the streams and ravines. Rightly so. This is correct. And this is what we're getting a, a picture of. Are we seeing the heavenly version or the earthly version? Well, we'll see. But we do know Ezekiel 5.5 5 says, Thus says Yahweh Elohim, This is Jerusalem. I have set her in the center of other nations with countries round about her. I went from thence to the middle of the earth, right? The center of the nations. And I saw a blessed place in which were trees with branches abiding and blooming of a dismembered tree. Think of, well, Romans 11, which we'll read here in a minute, where some of the uh, branches were cut off and others were grafted back in or grafted in, or grafted back in. But just to give you an idea here of what's going on, Jeremiah eleven sixteen, Yahweh called thy name an all, a green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit. With the noise of a great tumult has he kindled a fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. So this is, of course, Israel. Israel is this tree. Psalm 1, 1 through 3, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the Torah of Yahuwah, the law. And in his law, his Torah, does he meditate day and night. He thinks about it every day. And he, the person that does this, shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. It brings forth his fruit in his due season, and his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Now, John 15, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman, so he is the plant. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. So dismember a tree, right? And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now are you clean through the word which I have spoken to you? Abide in me, right? So he's the... He's the root, right? Uh, the, one of the prophecies about him is that um, he would be, um, you know, a branch from a, what was it? I'm sorry, it's, I it, mean, butcher this. It's Isaiah 10, I know that. Or 11. Yeah, it's 11, sorry, not 10. Yeah, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. <clears throat> so abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself so like if you break off a branch off a tree it's not going to produce leaves and fruit anymore is it except it abide in the vine no more can you except you abide in me so unless we abide in through Messiah Yahushua who is the word we can't bear any fruit I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue me in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall be abide in my love, even as if I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So this confirms what we read in Psalm 1, that the person that delights in the Torah and does his Torah and meditates on it, he is like a tree that brings forth his fruit and his leaf shall not wither. Romans 11, And if some of the branches be broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakes of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, Boast not against the branches, but if you boast, you bearest not the root, but the root you. You will say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. 
Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if Elohim spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not you. Behold, thereof the goodness and the severity of Elohim on them which fell, severity, but towards you goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also shall be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For Elohim is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the wall, out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted in contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall you, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So this is this is a long explanation of basically saying what he's saying here, right? So he went to the center of the earth, Jerusalem, and he saw there branches and abiding and blooming, bearing, starting to put forth its leaves and bloom and bear fruit of a dismembered tree, right? So he's seeing the, um, he's basically seeing the end result of the faith. The, the history of time showed that Israel was, was, give, was given the nation, given the vineyard, but they were kicked out, cut off, right? Broken off. And he's seeing that this tree is being regrafted and rebloomed, which is what's happening now in these last days. People are coming back to the truth of the Most High and starting to bear fruit after centuries, thousands of years of apostasy. And there I saw a holy mountain, and underneath the mountain to the east there was a stream, and it flowed towards the south. And I saw towards the east another mountain higher than this, and between them a deep and narrow ravine. It also ran a stream underneath the mountain. And we were reading a little bit about this in Ezekiel and Revelation, about the streams uh, running underneath. And to the west thereof there was another mountain, lower than the former, and of small elevation, and a ravine deep and dry between them. And another deep and dry ravine was at the extremities of these mountains. And all the ravines were deep and narrow, being formed of hard rock, and trees were not planted upon them. And I marveled at the rocks, and I marveled at the ravine. Yea, I marveled very much. So uh, we see three ravines here, right? So a narrow ravine and another ravine. And another deep and dry ravine. This is going to come in handy here in a second. And what is a ravine? A small, narrow, steep-sided valley. It's a valley. A ravine is a type of a valley. So this will this will uh, come in handy uh, here shortly. Um, also, just on the trees. Isaiah 61, 3, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of Yahuwah, that he might be glorified. Hallelujah. So we see, we've seen mountains, we've seen these rivers of waters, um, and now we've seen these three ravines. Well, what's going on here? So Enoch sees these ravines and he's like, he's going to start asking questions like, what's going on here? Chapter 27 of Enoch, then said I, for what object is this blessed land? Right? So he first he acknowledges he sees this blessed land. What's he seeing? Is he seeing physical Jerusalem? Is he seeing heavenly Jerusalem? So he say, for what object is this blessed land? Jerusalem or New Jerusalem, which is entirely filled with trees, right? Who wants to be one of those trees? I know I do. And this accursed valley between. Then Uriel, one of the holy angels who was, who was with me, answered and said, This accursed valley is for those who are accursed forever. Here shall all the accursed be gathered together who utter with their lips against Yahuwah unseemly words and of his glory speak hard things. Here shall they be gathered together and here shall be their place of judgment. In the last days there shall be upon them a spectacle of righteous judgment in the presence of the righteous forever. Right? So the righteous are going to see this with their eyes. Here shall the merciful bless, I'm sorry, here shall the merciful bless the Yahuwah of glory, the eternal king. In the days of judgment over the former, they shall bless him for the mercy in accordance with which he has assigned them their lot. Then I blessed Yahuwah of glory and set forth his glory and lauded him gloriously. So he is seeing end times. He's seeing the end times Jerusalem. Check this out. This gets really interesting. So first of all, 
let's confirm he's seeing Jerusalem. And we again, we know that the earthly was a copy of the heavenly. So let's take a look at physical Jerusalem. Um, you know, it's interesting, you know, in the book of Revelation, it talks about the this uh, set on seven hills. Everybody believes that the city set on seven hills is Rome. Well, did you know that Jerusalem is also a city of seven hills, but that's for another time. I think we talked about that last week, actually. But what's interesting is Jerusalem has three valleys. The Valley of Hinnom, the, what's it, how do we pronounce this? Tyropean, or the Central Valley, and the Valley of Jehoshaphat, or also known as the Kidron Valley. Another look here. The Valley of Hinnom. Oops, of course. Sorry about that. The Valley Hinnom, the Central Valley, and the Kidron or Valley of Jehoshaphat. One more look. Valley Hinnom, the Central Valley, Kidron Valley. Three valleys. So as we saw in Chapter 26, he saw this blessed land that had three valleys, three ravines, which are valleys. So he's asking, what's the purpose of this? So these valleys are where the accursed will be gathered together. They shall be gathered together here, and this shall be their place of judgment. Let's read that. Joel 3. For behold, in those days... This is the day of Yahweh, the end times, in those days and at that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations, right? He's going to gather them. They shall be gathered together. I will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, right? Which is the Kidron. I should have left these up. So, will it actually be this valley of Jehoshaphat? Or is this a copy of the heavenly Jerusalem comes down that has valleys as well? Hey, maybe so. I don't know exactly what it looks like. <laughs> I haven't seen it with my eyes, have you? I don't know. Oops, all right. So, I'll bring them, so he's going to gather all nations, bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. That's Joel 3, 1 through 2. We're going to skip down to verse 9 through 20. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, the nations, prepare for war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Yahuwah. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There it is. For there I will set to judge all the nations round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great multitudes multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of yahuwah is near in the valley of decision the sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining yahuwah also shall roar out of zion and utter his voice from jerusalem and the heavens and the earth shall shake but yahuwah will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of israel so shall you know that i am yahuwah your elohim dwelling in zion my holy mountain then shall jerusalem be holy and there shall no strangers pass through her any more and it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down with new wine and the hills shall flow with milk and all the rivers of judah shall flow with waters and a fountain shall come forth out of the house of yahuwah and shall the water shall water the valley of shittim Egypt shall be a desolation. Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall dwell forever in Jerusalem from generation to generation. A um, couple things. Actually, I didn't put it in the study, but I want to just quickly go over is to Ezra 13 is that we see that when he comes down um. So we see here, 
And behold, a multitude, an innumerable, an innumerable multitude of men were gathered together from the four winds of heaven to make war against the man who came up out of the sea, which later on is described as Messiah Yahusha. And I looked, and behold, he carved out for himself a great mountain and flew upon it. And I tried to see the region or place from which the mountain was carved, but I could not. Why? Because it was carved without hands. And we see that here in Second Baruch, uh, let's see, chapter, I think, 6, or is it 4? Maybe it's 6. Uh, no, yeah, 4. And Yahweh said unto me, This city, Jerusalem, shall be delivered up for a time, and the people shall be chastened during a time, and the world will not be given over to oblivion. Do you think that this is the city of which I said on the palms of my hands have I graven you? This building now built in your midst is not that which is revealed with me. That which was prepared beforehand here from the time when I took the counsel to make paradise and showed it to Adam before he sinned, but when he transgressed the commandment, it was removed from him as also paradise. And after these things, I showed it to my servant Abraham by night among the, the portions of the victims. And again, I also showed it to Moshe on Mount Sinai when I showed to him the likeness of the tabernacle and all its vessels. So here in Baruch says that Messiah Yahushua will be revealed with New Jerusalem. And so here... Uh, he destroys the multitude here, in the, of course, in the valley. And here's the interpretation. Let's see, where is it here? Okay. And when these things come to pass, the signs occur, which I showed you before, then my son will be revealed, whom you saw as a man coming up from the sea. And when all the nations hear his voice, every man shall leave his own land and the warfare that they have against one another. <clears throat> Listen to this. And an innumerable multitude shall be gathered together. And of course, this is what he's talking about. They shall be gathered together. This is what we saw in Joel. Um, I will gather all nations in the valley of Jehoshaphat, right? A multitude of eight shall be gathered together, as you saw, desiring to come and conquer him. But he will stand on top of Mount Zion, and Zion will come... It will come and be made manifest to all people prepared and built as you saw the mountain carved without hands. This is when he destroys them, right? And will destroy them without effort by the law, which is the Torah, which was symbolized by fire. Interesting, right? But we saw also here... <clears throat> um, yeah, right. And they shall, shall be gathered together. Here shall be their place of judgment. This is back at Enoch, of course. In the last days shall be upon them the spectacle of righteous judgment in the presence of the righteous forever. So the righteous are going to see this. Check this out. The story continues. Revelation 14, 1 through 4. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on top of Mount Zion, which we just saw in, Reve in 2 Ezra 13, will come and be prepared, and he will stand on top of it. A lamb stood on Mount Zion and with him and 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers or guitarists guitaring with their guitars. <laughs> it's the Greek is kitara. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man can learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. And these are they which were not defiled with women for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits of Elohim unto the Lamb. And I know a lot of people have different interpretations of who the 144,000 are. I'm not here to say anyone's wrong. Um, I do have an opinion, of course, or I do have what I understand the scriptures. Um, if you'd like to, to see that, um, let me see here. I'll share that with you. For sure, you can just type in uh, parable of the vineyard, 144,000. Yeah, that's the one. Okay. I've got a couple studies on it, but I think the most, my most accurate understanding at this time, uh, you just type, it's just the 144,000 Revelation 14 decoded. Uh, we did this about a little over a year ago. So check that out. If you want to know more about that, we could spend, well, as you see here, oh, good, about two hours on that subject if you'd uh, like that, but we're not going to do that today. 
<clears throat> but moving forward, you see, so the Yahusha is on top of Mount Zion. His righteous are with him. Revelation 14, 4 through 20. We're going to skip down. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud, one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a, go a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time it is to come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Another angel came out of the temple, which is in the heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. Another angel came out of the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud voice unto him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of Elohim. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand six hundred furlongs. Whew, right, so here is the judgment. And, uh, right, so we saw here in Joel 3, of course, they're gathered into the valley of Jehoshaphat to judge, Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the wine press is full. The fats overflow, for the wickedness of great is great. Multitudes, multitudes, so just massive amount of people. Billions, maybe, ready to come destroy him. But it ain't going to happen. Here shall they, this so back to Enoch. Here shall they be gathered together. Here shall be their place of judgment. In the last days there shall be upon them the spectacle of righteous judgment in the presence of the righteous forever. Here shall the merciful bless Yahweh the, of glory, the eternal king. So, again, so what's Enoch actually seeing? He's seeing prophecy. This is a book of prophecy. He's seeing the future here, and it's all in kind of parable form. Praise Yah. In these last days, he's given us all these books that we can, like, put the pieces together. Praise be to Yah, who is revealing wisdom in these last days. To Ezra 7, 37 38 Then the Most High will say to the nations that have been raised from the dead, Look now and understand whom you have denied, whom you have not served, whose commandments you have despised. Look on this side on that. Here are delight and rest, New Jerusalem, and there are fire and torments. Thus he will speak to them on the day of judgment, the day of Yah. Psalm 91, 7 through 8 A thousand shall fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come nigh you. I believe this part right here of Night of Psalm 91 is this, is this judgment we're seeing here. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. There shall be upon them the spectacle of righteous judgment in the presence of the righteous forever. It's going to be hard. That's going to be hard to watch. Especially because there's probably going to be people we know that just won't listen and won't won't make it. Um, the book of Isaiah, chapter 66, in the Aramaic, we see something interesting. This is the last days, of course, judgment, gathering of the righteous, and they shall bring all your brethren out of all the nations, an offering before Yahweh upon horses and chariots and litters and upon mules, yea, with songs unto my set-apart mountain, Yerushalayim, a new song, right? Says Yahuwah, as the children of Yashrael bring an offering and a clean vessel unto the house of the sanctuary of Yahuwah. And I will take, and I will also take of them to be priests and Levites, says Yahuwah. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says Yahuwah, thus shall your seed and your name be made to remain. And it shall come to pass at the time of the beginning of each month and the time of each Shabbat that all flesh shall come to worship before me, says Yahuwah. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men, the sinners, who have rebelled against my word. For their souls shall not die, and their fire shall not be quenched, and the wicked shall be judged in Sheol, till the righteous shall say concerning them, We have seen enough. That's going to be hard. But righteous is the judgment of Yahuwah. So think of that. Think of that day. Think of that day and who might be included in that. And I'm, I'm talking to myself right now. About the love and the effort we should show forth to our friends, our family, 
and not be contentious with them because they're just blind. They don't, we're not wrestling with them, even their stubbornness. We should share the truth in love and just pray for them, even fast for them if need be. All right, Enoch uh, 28. And from there, I went toward the east into the midst of the mountain range of the desert. Remember this, the desert. And I saw a wilderness or a desert, and it was solitary, full of trees and plants, which I just drove through the desert last week. And yeah, it's not, not a lot of fruit-bearing plants, that's for sure. And water gushed forth from above, rushing like a copious watercourse, which flowed towards the northwest. It caused clouds and dew to ascend on every side. So what's he seeing here? First of all, remember, we he saw the order of events, that the dismembered tree, right, that it become desolate and then reblooming. Same thing with the nation. Isaiah 34, 1 through 4. Come, ye nations, to hear and hearken, ye people. Let the earth hear and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of Yahuwah is upon all nations and his fury upon all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. And all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falls from off the vine, and as a falling fig from the tree. Now let's take a look on the other side of things. Oops, uh, actually I think I had the Targums of Isaiah th chapter 35 pulled up. They that dwell in the wilderness, in a thirsty land, a desert, shall rejoice, and those that inhabit the, d the desert shall rejoice, and shall shine as lilies. That's what we're talking about here, right? And there I went towards the east into the midst of a mountain range of the desert. And I saw in a wilderness and it was solitary, full of trees and plants. We're getting another vision of that here in Isaiah 35. They that dwell in the wilderness and a thirsty land shall rejoice. And those that inhabit the, the desert shall rejoice and shall shine as the lilies. They shall greatly rejoice and be glad, yea, with joy and with gladness. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto them. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. The house of Yashrael, Israel, to whom these things are promised, they shall see the glory of Yahweh, the beauty of our Elohim. The prophet said, Strengthen you the weak hands and confirm you the feeble knees. Don't fear, right? Say you to the fearful of heart, they may keep the Torah. Be you strong and fear not. Behold, your Elohim shall be revealed to take vengeance of judgment. Yahweh of retributions, Yahweh shall be revealed and he shall save you. Then the eyes of Israel shall be opened, which were blind to the Torah, and their ears, which were as of the deaf, shall hear and receive the words of the prophets. When they shall see the captives of Israel gather to go up to their own land as the swift hearts and tarry not, they shall sing with their tongue, which has been tied, because the waters shall gush forth in the wilderness and rivers in the plain. That's what we're seeing right here. Right? And the waters gush forth from above. In, in creating these wonderful plants. Then the mirage shall become pools of waters and the thirsty place springs of water in the place where the dragons dwell. Reeds and rushes shall come up. A trodden way shall be there and a straight one. This is the narrow path. And it shall be called the way of set apartness. The unclean shall not pass over it and the wayfaring men shall not seize. The ignorant shall not err. There shall not be there a king doing evil and an oppressive governor shall not pass over it. Yea, they shall not be found there but the redeemed shall walk there. And the redeemed of Yahweh shall return because they shall be gathered from the midst of their captivity and shall come to Zion with a song, maybe even a new song. And they shall have everlasting joy, which shall not cease. And a cloud of glory shall overshadow their heads. Joy and gladness shall be found and sorrow and sighing shall cease from them, namely from the house of Yashrael. Do I have it in here? Isaiah 55. Ho, everyone that thirsts, come ye to the waters. And he that has no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come and buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfies not? Hearken diligently unto me. All right, what is this water? Blessed is he who hungers and thirsts after righteousness, for they shall be filled Matthew 5. 
Deuteronomy 32, Give ear, you, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, and my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and the showers upon the grass. If we're to be trees of righteousness, we're to drink in, we're to, we're to, to take in his doctrine. And this doctrine is through the perfected teaching of Messiah Husha. Right? Out of his belly shall flow living, uh, living waters, right? That's his doctrine. That's the truth. Chapter 29. And thence I went to another place in the desert and approached to the east of this mountain range. And there I saw aromatic trees exhaling the fragrance of frankincense and myrrh. And the trees also were similar to the almond tree. Are these physical trees? Probably. Is there a parable behind it? Sure. First of all, this is an interesting little passage, Mark 8.24. And he looked up and said, I see men walking as trees. Interesting, right? Let me close a couple of these tabs. I got a bunch of tabs open. Revelation 8.4. And the smoke of the incense which came up with the prayers of the saints ascended up before Elohim out of the angel's hand. Psalm 141, 2, let my prayers be set before you as incense and the lifting up my hands as the evening sacrifice. This is well-pleasing in Yahweh's sight. Check this out. Book of Sirach, also known as Ecclesiasticus, uh, was included in the 1611 KJV in the Apocrypha section. 35, 1 through 6, he who keeps the law, the Torah, makes many offerings. He who heeds the commandments sacrifices a peace offering. He who returns a kindness offers fine flour. And he who gives alms sacrifices a thanks offering. To keep from wickedness is pleasing to Yahuwah, and to forsake unrighteousness is atonement. Do not appear before Yahuwah empty-handed, for all these things are to be done because of the commandment. Now listen to this. The offering of a righteous man anoints the altar, and its pleasing odor rises before the Most High. Pretty cool. Enoch 30. And beyond these I went afar to the east and saw another place, a valley full of water. And therein there was a tree, the color of a fragrant tree, such as the mastic. And on the sides of those valleys I saw fragrant cinnamon, and beyond these I proceeded to the east. 31. And I saw other mountains, and amongst them were groves of trees, and there flowed forth from them nectar, which is named Sarara and Galbanum. And beyond these mountains I saw another mountain, to the east of the ends of the earth, whereon were aloe trees, and all the trees were full of stacte, being like almond trees, and when one burnt it, it smelled sweeter than any fragrant odor. 32. And after these fragrant odors, I looked toward the north over the mountains. I saw seven mountains. There, here we go again. Full of choice nard and fragrant trees and cinnamon and pepper. And thence I went over the summits of all these mountains far towards the east of the earth and passed above the Erythrean Sea and went far from it and passed over the angel Zotiel. And came, when we talked about the Erythrean Sea yes, uh, last week, and yeah, showed you where that was in relation. And I came to the garden of righteousness, and I saw beyond those trees many large trees growing there in a goodly fragrance, large, very beautiful, and glorious, and a tree of wisdom whereof they eat and know great wisdom. That is, that tree is in height like the fir, and its leaves like those of the carob tree, and its fruit is like the clusters of the vine, very beautiful, and the fragrance of the tree penetrates afar. Then I said, How beautiful is the tree, and how attractive is its look? Then Raphael, the holy angel who was with me, answered me and said, This is the tree of wisdom, of which thy father, old in years, and thy aged mother, who were before you, have eaten, and they learnt wisdom, and their eyes were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they were driven out of the garden. So he see, he's seeing here the the uh, the tree of knowledge of, of good and evil, or of, of wisdom. And he's saying that the fruit is like the clusters of the vine, so like grapes. We have an interesting confirmation here in the Apocalypse of Abraham. <clears throat> Interesting read. And we're going to read on the right-hand column. And we're going to read chapter 32 through 36. So we're going to read over here on the side. And I said, O eternal mighty one, what is this vision and picture of the creatures? And he said to me, This is my will for those who exist in the divine world council. For thus it seemed well-pleasing in my sight. And so afterwards I gave commandment to them through my word. 
And so it came to pass that whatever I had determined to be was already planned before in this picture vision before you. And it has stood before me before it was created as you have seen. And I said, Oh, Yahuwah, mighty and eternal, who are the people in this picture and on this side and on that? And he said to me, those who are on the left side are all those born before your day and afterwards, some destined for judgment and restoration and others for vengeance and cutting off at the end of the age. But those on the right side of the picture, they are the people who have been set apart for me and whom I have ordained to be born of your line and called my people, even some of those who derived from Azazel, who were once evil, but turned to righteousness." Now look again in the picture and see who it is who seduced Eve and what is the fruit of the tree and you will know what it is to be and how it shall be with your seed among the people at the end of the days of the age and all that you cannot understand I will make known to you for you are well pleasing in my sight and I will tell you of those things which are kept in my heart. And I looked into the picture, and my eyes ran to the side of the Garden of Eden. I saw there a man of imposing height and mighty in stature, incomparable in aspect. And he was so really tall, right? And was embracing a woman who likewise approximated to the aspect of his size and stature. And they were standing under a tree of the Garden of Eden. So is this the size of the exalted body of man and woman? when maybe in the resurrection or when they're in the in the, the, the kingdom are they going to be just massive height maybe and listen and the fruit of this tree was like a bunch of grapes of the vines the tree of knowledge right and standing behind the tree was one who had the aspect of a serpent having hands and feet like those of a man and wings on its shoulders a dragon six pairs of wings so that there were six wings on the right and six on the left a cherubim and as I continued looking, I saw the man and the woman eating of the fruit of the tree. And I said, who are these who are embracing and who is the one between them who is behind the tree? And what is the fruit that they are eating? And he said, this is the counsel of the world. And this one is Adam. And this one who is their desire upon the earth is Eve. But he who is between them represents ungodliness and their beginnings on the way to perdition, even Azazel. So there it is, confirmation. <clears throat> Uh, if you haven't read the book Apocalypse of Abraham, I would recommend it. It is a fascinating read. Chapter 33 of Enoch. And from thence I went to the ends of the earth and saw there great beasts, and each differed one from the other. And I saw birds also differing in appearance and beauty and voice, the one differing from the other. And to the east of those beasts I saw the ends of the earth, whereon the heaven rests, and the portals of the heaven open. And I saw how the stars of heaven come forth. And I counted the portals out of which they proceed and wrote down all their outlets. Of each individual star by itself, according to the number of their names, their courses, and their positions, and their times, and their months, as Uriel the holy angel who was with me showed me. We're going to be talking quite a bit about the heavenly luminaries and the movements of the heavenly bodies, how it relates to the calendar, days, years, months, all those kind of things, when we get to chapter 72, I believe. I think it's 72 through 77 or 78. He showed all things to me and wrote them down for me, also their names he wrote for me, and their laws and their companies. Chapter 34. And from thence I went towards the north to the ends of the earth, and there I saw a great and glorious device at the ends of the whole earth. And here I saw three portals of heaven open in the heaven. Through each of them proceed north winds. When they blow, there is cold, hail, frost, snow, dew, and rain. And out of one portal they blow for good. But when they blow through the other two portals, it is with violence and affliction on the earth, and they blow with violence. So this is an interesting uh, chapter here because, you know, Climate change is a uh, big, uh, big emerging topic right now, and a lot of people will immediately run and say, "Ah, weather manipulation, harp, um, all these other things." And you know, maybe so, maybe. But here in the Book of Enoch, and also, of course, in in the, in the Bible, it says that Elohim, our our Father, is in control of all these things. And so, here in the Book of Enoch, it says specifically that. The heavens are in control whether there's good weather or whether there's bad weather. So, I don't know. It's something to, something to consider. Either way, um, yeah, the whole climate change thing, that's something that we're going to probably have to talk about here shortly and what that looks like in its future and how that relates to the world and prophecy and all that kind of stuff. Chapter 35. 
And from thence I went towards the west to the ends of the earth, and I saw there three portals of the heaven open, such as I have seen in the east, the same number of portals and the same number of outlets. And here's the last chapter we're going to read today. Um, yeah, so we were able to get through quite a bit today in, uh, wow, less than an hour. This is a, a record. Uh, not that there was really much to, to rush through, but some of these chapters are like two two verses and, um, you know, trying to trying to go through every part of this book that really we should dig into. And um, some of these chapters, you know, I think we can kind of just go through and get a vision of what he's seeing. And sometimes there's parables behind these visions. And as you saw in the earlier chapters, we went through them. So anyways, nevertheless, chapter 36. And then from thence, I went to the south to the ends of the earth and saw there three open portals of the heaven and thence there come dew, rain, and wind. And from thence I went to the east of the ends of the heaven and saw here the three eastern portals of heaven open and small portals above them. Through each of these small portals pass the stars of heaven and run their course to the west on the path which is shown to them. And, you know, this is just continued descriptions that <clears throat> these portals, um, which are in the firmament, right, are where all these stars pass through. So stars is, you know, the the what's outside, you know, what we were told in, the, in in school growing up is the solar system that is ever expanding universe and there's billions of planets and there's millions of other uh, earths like ours where this is nothing special. And uh, <clears throat> I just don't believe any of that anymore. And what the book of Enoch is saying is that all these stars pass through these portals, which are set in the firmament, right? They're like little windows of heaven. I believe that. I do. And as often as I saw, I blessed always Yahuwah of glory. And I continued to bless Yahuwah of glory, who has wrought great and glorious wonders. Now, so to show the greatness of his work to the angels and to the spirits and to men, that they might praise his work and all his creation, that they might see the work of his might and praise the great work of his hands and bless him forever. So this is probably the, this might be, uh, well, this and the what we talked about, the commandments being the most important. This is it. I mean, you think about everything. You think about, put yourself in his shoe for, for just a moment. I know it's impossible, but right through Messiah, the word, he made everything, all this, our father, right? Everything. And I know we talked a lot about this in the first part one of this. So just in case you're, you wa you're watching this and didn't watch part one, we really go in depth about this. But just, just, you know, just as a quick review, I mean, this is our Heavenly Father that sat down and made everything. Like every little detail. I mean, think about all the just... Think about all the birds and all the different varying colors they have and how beautiful they are. And what about the butterflies? All the different colors and, and, and they come in. And all the different sea creatures. Like we have a really cool um, aquarium here. Um, Bass Pro Shops has a, a really nice aquarium here. And uh, the kids and I, we love to, the children and I, we love to go through that and just look at all the different sea creatures. And just, that's just amazing. Ever gone to the zoo and looked at all the, the animals he made? And it's just a glimpse of how many, you know, animals he's actually made. And, you know, one thing I never appreciated growing up is trees. And I'm starting to, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, a, you know, an expert by any means now. And I've got a lot to learn, but just appreciating what they look like. And especially like in the fall, when they change color, leaves change colors. And it's just all the stuff we just, most of us, I'm not, I, I can't say that everybody, but most of us took for granted of how beautiful this earth really is now. Un unfortunately, it's ruled in unrighteousness right now, but still, the world is beautiful. The earth he's made for us is beautiful and, and probably even just a fraction of the beauty of the Garden of Eden, of course. And uh, I don't know, just appreciating what he's made for us. I, I can imagine maybe once in a while he wants just a little thanks, like, hey, thanks. How about this cool cup of refreshing water? Like, thanks, right? Don't thank him for Coke because he didn't make that. Men made that amalgamation <clears throat> with the toxins in there. I'm sorry. Let me not preach about soda. But no, seriously, though, like, what about the, the, the diverse flavors of food, right? 
What about the sunrises and the sunsets and the beautiful, beautiful scenery that he, he puts for us? How about the beauty of the moon? I think the moon's, the moon's beautiful. The stars. Ah, man. We shouldn't take it for granted. We should not take it for granted. There's an interesting passage here in Second Baruch, uh, chapter 54, that I just love. And we're going to read it. I'm going to start at verse 7. Second uh, Baruch 54. For, for I know that as regards those things wherein I besought you, I have received a response. And as regards what I besought you, you did reveal to me with what voice I should praise you and from what members I should cause praises and hallelujahs to ascend to you. Now listen to this. I love this verse. For if my members were mouths and the hairs of my head voices, think of, think of every little strand of hair. Every strand of hair had voices. Maybe that, that visual might be creepy, but think about it. Think about it, you know, think about it. Yeah. If the hairs of my head had voices, even so I could not give you the meat of praise, nor lodge you as is befitting, nor could I recount your praise, nor tell the glory of your beauty. So he's basically saying like, if all the hairs of my head were had voices and we're all singing to you, it still wouldn't be enough for what you deserve. I love that. For what am I amongst men? What am, what are we? What is man that you even care for him? Look at what he's made. I mean, look at the complexity of us and our bodies. For what am I amongst men? Or why am I a reckoned amongst those who are more excellent than I that I've heard all these marvelous things from El Elyon and numberless promises from him who created me? Who are we that he allow us to open, to open our eyes and to see his truth, to see his true Messiah, to see his true word? And the truth of his Torah in these last days. What are we? What am I? I'm a, I lived a disgusting life. I don't deserve this. What about you? Do you deserve this? Do you deserve to understand his truth? To be awake in these last days? Blessed be, we're going to read to verse 19. Blessed be my mother among those that bear and praise among women be she that bore me. For I will not be silent in praising El Elohim. I will not be silent, praising him. And with the voices of praise, I will recount his marvelous deeds. Do we do that enough? Do we tell people of what he does for us? I'll tell you right here. He saved me from sure death. I was on a course to hell. And he could have just been like, you're disgusting. I'm just going to let you go into hell. But he saved me. He saved my life. He left the 99 and came and grabbed me. And I'm eternally thankful. Am I perfect? No. Do I want to be? Yeah, for him. Absolutely. Absolutely I do. Praise be to Messiah Yahusha, who gives us that atonement and forgiveness of sins. He saved me from sheer death, not just spiritual death, but I should have died. And he saved me. He saved my life and I know it. He's given me this ministry and the wisdom to be able, be able to sit up here and speak anything of truth that would resonate with anybody. Do I mess it up sometimes and have some things wrong? Sure, I'm sure I do. And that's on me. But anything good from him, I'll tell you that right now. I grew up, I wasn't very studious. I wasn't above average in intelligence level. Why he would choose someone like me to teach his word couldn't tell you but I'm thankful and he's merciful what's he done for you for who does like unto your marvelous deeds O Elohim or who comprehends your deep thought of life for with your counsel you do govern all the creatures which your right hand which is Messiah has created and you have established every fountain of light beside you and the treasures of wisdom beneath your throne have you prepared and justly do they perish who have not loved your Torah. And this is what I was saying earlier about that judgment that we're going to see with our own eyes. Or I say we. How can I count myself among the righteous? I want to be. And justly do they perish who have not loved your Torah. 
and the torment of judgment shall await those who have not submitted themselves to your power. For though Adam first sinned and brought untimely death upon all, yet of those who were born from him, each one of them has prepared for his own soul torment to come. And again, each one of them has chosen for himself the glories to come. For assuredly, he who believes will receive reward. But now, as for you, you wicked that now are, turn ye to destruction, because ye shall speedily be visited, and that formerly ye rejected the understanding of El Elyon. For his works have not taught you, Right, so you can't even you look around and you still can't even see that there's a creator, nor has a skill of his creation which is at all times persuaded you. Adam is therefore not the cause, save only his own soul. But each of us has been the Adam of his own soul. Psalm ninety-two. It is good. It is a good thing to give thanks unto Yahuwah. And to sing praises unto your name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night, upon an instrument of ten strings, or six, and upon the psaltery, upon the harp with a solemn sound, for you, Yahuwah, has made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of your hands, O Yahuwah, how great are your works, and thy thoughts are very deep. A brutish man knows not, neither does a fool understand this. When the wicked spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is they that shall be destroyed forever. But you, Yahuwah, are most high forevermore. For lo, your enemies, O Yahuwah, for lo, your enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But my horn shall you exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Mine eye also shall see my desire on my enemies, and my ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of Yahuwah shall flourish in the courts of our Elohim. They shall bring, still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that Yahuwah is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Read this again. We're going to finish with this. And as often as I saw, I blessed always Yahuwah of glory and continued to bless Yahuwah of glory, who has wrought great and glorious wonders to show the greatness of his work to the angels and to the spirits of men, that they might praise his work and all his creation, that they might see the work of his might and praise the work of his hands and bless him forever. Brothers and sisters, I was, uh, as some of you know, I was on a journey uh, the last few weeks. I went to California to see my father. My earthly father, that is, and um, I drove from Missouri to California and back. And I tell you, you know, going from the the mountainous ranges here to the flat plain in Texas to the Red Rock and deserty area of New Mexico, and and then of course going into Arizona and. Uh, got to, I went to see the the petrified national forest in Arizona, where you had those pieces of uh, trees. I don't know. I'm probably make a little video of some of the um, uh, some of the uh, footage I got. But some of these trees are just so beautiful. I don't know if you can see this, but like that's a that's a tree. Petrified wood. Mm. Check this out. Like, just so beautiful. And, uh, of course, then I uh, went to the Grand Canyon. Uh, just to see, and it just it's just breathtaking. Right? Just breathtaking. The works of his hands now. There's a lot of different opinions on what the Grand Canyon is. Personally, I think it was one of the fountains of the deep that was broken open in the flood. But just seeing the works of his hands, and then of course getting into California, where you've got the mountains, the valleys, you've got the beach. <sighs> the city's crazy, and I'm, I don't miss Southern California. I grew up there. I don't miss it at all, but just his creation is just amazing, and this is who we serve. We serve the Elohim that created the heavens and the earth and everything contained in it, including us. And we should praise him, praise him and praise the works of his hands. That's what it says. They might show the greatness of his work to the angels and to the spirits of men, that they might praise his work and all his creation. 
they might see the work of his might and the praise, the great work of his hands and bless him forever. And while I was in California, it rained a lot. So uh, the mountains there, I think there's the San Bernardino Mountains, just covered with snow. It's just so beautiful. In any case, enough about that. Let's pray. We're going to pray and then we're going to do a couple songs of praise to Yahuwah. Heavenly Father, Yahuwah, we just come before you. And Abba, we just bless you. We acknowledge that you, through your word, Yahusha, created the heavens and the earth and everything contained in it, including us, the beasts of the field, the, the birds of the air, the fishes of the sea, and everything, Father, the flowers, the the trees, the plants, the sun, the moon, the stars, everything, the firmament, that you are our creator, and we love you, and we just want to connect with you. We want to show our love by our obedience to your word, Father. So give us understanding that we may live. Teach us your commandments, Father, that we may do what's right in your sight. We want to have the right to the tree of life and enter into the gates, into the city through the gates, Father. So help us understand. Give us growth. Give us repentance. Give us your truth, your light, Father. We thank you for Messiah who, who came and showed us how to do these things in spirit and truth. We love you, Father. We say Shabbat Shalom to you. Thank you for teaching us your Sabbath, your feast days, and all the other commandments that we're able to keep in these last days. Teach us, Father. We love you and thank you for all that you do, and we bless you. In Yahushua's mighty, mighty name, Amen and Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's do a couple songs, brothers and sisters, of praise. Uh, this was actually the first song I ever wrote. I wrote on a Shabbat, maybe about a, a little over a year ago. Yeah. Maybe like 14, 15 months ago. Anyways, I pray it's a blessing to you. Um, blessings in Yahushua's name. We'll see you next week with the parables. Blessed are you, Yahweh's our You gave us of your sons so we could have hope. How to walk in spirit and in truth He is the vine to him we bear fruit Your words a lamp unto our feet Our hearts desire with every single beat Your Torah inside us commandments we know Till that creature fall we wait until it's gone When you said Seeking my face My heart said unto you your face will not see And sound at far And go with the shout We'll sing you praises Praises to our King And clap your hands All His people And sing with joy To our enemies Turning to his way Leaving Babylon, Yahushua, don't delay Parking to his people, his doctrine drops his rain Keeping the commandments lest you walk in vain His Torah is no burden no matter what you told Sweeter than honey and worth more than gold When you said Seeking my face My heart said unto you your face will not see And sound that shofar And go with the shout We'll sing you praises Praises to our King And clap your hands All His people And sing with joy To our enemies And is chosen to him we belong Worthy is the Lamb for he who was slain Made us kings and priests by him we shall reign Open ye the gates for those that keep the truth You'll give us lasting peace of minds that stayed on you Striving to shine bright like your menorah Walking in the way, the truth, your Torah I'll never go back Never go
My heart said unto you Your face will I see And sound at your far end Come on with the shout We'll sing you praises Praises to our King And clap your hands All His people Let's sing a little song about the two greatest commandments, loving Yahuwah and loving people. Let's start with how we love Him. You shall not have any other Blessed are those who 